Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Thank you for gathering us here in this place and thank you for the word that you have given to us through your servant John. Thank you for this chapter 2 of uh, this first letter that he has written. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would receive it into our hearts as we hear it. We pray, Father, that it would be impactful to us so that we might indeed live according to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We are in 1 John chapter 2. You know, as I'm reading through this letter of John, I am noticing that one of the big keys for this particular letter, and it's a very brief little letter. I mean, they are going to get shorter, but this is pretty brief. He really is pointing out the difference between belonging to God and not belonging to God, belonging to the light, belonging to the darkness. You know, there were two trees in the Garden of Eden. Well, there were lots of trees, but there were two in the center of the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The choice was life or death, God, or life lived without him, which is death. One was life and light, and the other one was death and darkness. Now, when it comes to the, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God is not anti-knowledge. He's not anti-knowledge at all, but he wants to be the very source of our knowledge. That's the key. And when the enemy came to deceive Eve with the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was tempting her to gain knowledge without God, to live without God, to have knowledge. He is still trading in that knowledge today, tempting people to have knowledge that they should not have. So the letter of the Apostle John points out that there, there really is a difference between light and darkness. There really is a difference between the ways of God and the ways of the world. Uh, the two are not compatible. In fact, they are enemies. They are enemies. Um, and so let's listen. You know, as we are listening to this letter, let's listen to the difference. You know, I think now that it's pointed out that this is what this letter has a lot of, I think it's going to just really um, pop out at us and go, oh yeah, that's what that's about. I want to begin by reading chapter 1, just reading it, because it's been a couple of weeks, and we've all slept since then. I sure hope we have. And then I'll get into chapter 2. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2 begins, My Little Children. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now there's a nice big word, propitiation. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Propitiation means Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. He is the atonement. He is our atoning sacrifice. He is the atoning sacrifice for the entire world. When he hung on the cross, he was hanging on the cross for all of us. All sin was put on him at that time. So he is the one who is our propitiator. He is our atoning sacrifice. Verse 3 says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That is a stickler today. There are many, many people today, unfortunately even in the church, that says, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the law. He is the end of the law. And I have no reason whatsoever to keep the commandments of God. I don't have to keep them. And even if I don't keep them, God is going to, I mean, even if I sin, and even as I sin, God is going to forgive me. He has to forgive me because of Jesus. That is absolutely wrong. It's not that Jesus isn't in the, in the business of forgiving sins. He is. That's why he died. But Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verse 1, starts out, Shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? And he said, no. He said, you died to sin. How is it you want to keep going and living in it? We died to sin. We don't keep wallowing in it. Verse 3, by this we know, if, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. The two go together. If we say we know him, we keep his commandments. It's that simple. In other words, if we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have got to have a lifestyle change. I mean, what did, what did the... I mean, Paul wrote this in a number of places, but one of them was, you know... In Christ we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. If we keep sinning what we are, and, and trying to claim that we believe in Jesus Christ but keep sinning, basically we're trying to have one foot in both camps. The camp that is the kingdom of darkness and the camp that is the kingdom of light. But the two do not mix. Life and death do not go together. Light and darkness do not go together. The kingdom of God does not go with the kingdom of darkness. The world is opposed to God. Absolutely opposed to God. Verse 4 says, The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. He's got some strong words here. He says he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. What did Jesus say? This is John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me. In other words, our keeping the commandments, it's not a prerequisite by any stretch of the imaginations for our getting into heaven. We don't keep the commandments in order to be saved. We keep the commandments to show our love for our God. I mean, we keep our commandments because, keep his commandments because it was our sin that put him on the cross. So we're going to just keep on sinning. That's just snubbing our noses at what he did on the cross if we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. How dumb is that? That's just dumb. So the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been, has truly been perfected. And that, you know, it's like has been. It's a perfect passive verb. It's something 
has happened to this person. You know, they have been perfected. They have been matured. In other words, I mean, it's probably not that all of a sudden, whammo, we're going to be perfected. No, it's as we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, as we grow closer and closer to him, and as we continue to honor our God by keeping his commandments, he is the one maturing us and growing us and, and perfecting us. Verse 5 continues, By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he, meaning Jesus, walked. Well, how did Jesus walk? Well, he walked in absolutely complete obedience to the Father. He says in John's Gospel, he says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. I don't even speak. The words I speak are from the Father. So the things he said were from the Father. The things he did is what he saw the Father doing. So, this, so it says here, you know, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walks. So if we say we abide in him, then we need to be seeking out what the Father is doing and then coming alongside him to work beside him. We are co-laborers with God. So if we're going to be co-laborers with God, we better find out what he's doing so that we can labor with him. Verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Isn't that good news? He says, I'm not writing to you a new commandment. It's an old one. That you've had from the beginning. What did they have from the beginning? Well, if you look in the Old Testament, or the Older Testament, you find that love is the summary of the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And as Jesus would say, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the sum of the commandments. It's all about love. So they knew that. So what, what he's writing is nothing new. But he says, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you. What was new? Well, what was really new was seeing the extent of love that God had for the world and the extent to which God was, that God did go for us. Who would have thought that the Lord would hang on a tree with nail-pierced hands, with nails in his feet, and then later on, you know, with a spear pierced into his side? Who would have thought it? Now, we do know that it was all hidden in the Word of God all along. But they didn't get it. Okay? So, very important for us to know that Yes, they had the command to love, but the new part is, is finding out just how much God loved people. But it says, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you. Well, what's the part about in us? Well, the part is, is that as we have seen what the Lord has done for us, that great love that was poured out through his Son, now we in turn can love others as we've been loved. That's what it's about, is loving as we have been loved. Now, none of us are going to go to the cross for anybody. Okay? Jesus did that for us. But, when we see how much God loves us, then we can, in turn, turn and give that kind of love to other people. Well, we didn't deserve the love. And so, when other people are, you know, really in need of love, even though they're not very lovable or not doing very loving things, you know, we've got to think, Jesus did it for me, let me do it for them. Okay? Love. What's really also wonderful of this particular verse 8 says that, you know, um, 
On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Isn't that good news? The darkness is passing away. The world was steeped in darkness from sin when it entered into the world. The world, the sun may have been shining, and it was light in the morning and dark in the evening, because that's the way it works, but spiritually the world was dark. Deep, deep darkness. But with the coming of Jesus, light broke into the world. Now we know for a fact that light always is victorious over darkness. Always. It always is victorious. Now he says the darkness is passing away. Now I, granted, it doesn't look like it. It looks like darkness is getting darker. And we wonder, where is the light? Well, the light is shining. And we also know for a fact that as the darkness gets darker, the light shines brighter. And light always triumphs over darkness. The darkness, it, God doesn't lie. The darkness is passing away. And the true light, the true light is already shining. Verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The two do not go together. I mean, if there's anything you get out of this chapter is light and dark don't go together. Good and bad don't go together. You know, life and death don't go together. The world and the ways of God don't go together. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God don't go together. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like trying to mix oil and water. Excuse me, they don't mix. They'll separate. And there's a nice line, clear line between the two. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now the next couple of verses here, let me just show you. Can you see that? Um... It's very interesting. They're they parallel, match. Verse 12 says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. And he says, I'm writing you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. But then he seems to repeat himself. He says, I have written to you children because you know the Father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the get beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I mean, just stick it together. It works, works perfectly. You know, first is I am writing to you, but it, the next is I have written to you. I am writing, I have written, I am writing, I have written. And you've got the little children, the fathers, and the young men. In other words, all ages, everybody receives this word. It's an encouraging word to receive from John. So you have encouraging words followed by a cautionary word. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful, boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Don't love the world. That's a hard thing to do because it surrounds us. We're swimming in it. And the world does its best to draw us away from God all the time. But he says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. The world is passing away. And also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Darkness is passing away. The world is passing away. Death is passing away. Life is eternal. Verse 18, children, it is the last hour. 
And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Well, that was nearly 2,000 years ago. It was the last hour then. Don't you think we're a little closer now? I think we're a lot closer now. Antichrist means against Christ. And Christ means anointing. So Antichrist means against the anointing or against the anointed one. Okay, And yes, eventually it will be a person where all this evil is going to be poured out into this one person and he's going to come against all the people of God. He's going to be just the personification of evil. But it is also a spirit that has been alive and well unfortunately, in the earth from the beginning. When sin entered the world, that was an antichrist spirit. Christ wasn't on the scene, but the spirit there, the evil one, he was trying to undo the plans of God. That's why he went and deceived Eve. He was undoing what God, he was trying to undo what God had begun. That's an antichrist spirit. But he says here that they, those who have the Antichrist spirit, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they, are, that they all are not of us. Basically, it means that believers and unbelievers can be in the same congregation at the same time, but he says these left. In his particular circumstances, there were some that left the congregation, meaning they didn't really belong all along. They did not belong. If they would have belonged, they would have remained. And so it's very important for us to see that, um, you know, there can be those within the church that, that do not really belong to Christ. But he says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. But he turns to them and he says, but you, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know it because no lie is of the truth remember God cannot lie he always speaks truth he's been speaking truth from the get go when he told Adam and Eve don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for in that day that you eat of it you will die he was telling the truth there is no lie of the truth who is the liar? Now, this is a spiritual test, you know, a parameter that we can use to see if a spirit who is trying to get into our midst or, you know, tempt us or test us or whatever. Here's the test. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. John was dealing already, and the early church was already dealing with a heretical sect called Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, well, definitely of the devil, because the thing of it was, Gnosticism means to know. Sounds like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Gnosticism means to know, and the Gnostics thought they had special knowledge. And for the Gnostics, people had a body and a spirit. Body, body was bad, spirit was good. The whole idea was to, uh, you know, you could do anything to the body, including sin, which is part of why we're reading some of the stuff that we're reading. They thought you could sin it all up. Go ahead and hurt the body with sin. It doesn't affect the spirit. The spirit, you know, the spirit needs to slough off the body anyway, body bad. So that the spirit can go and be a part 
of God. <coughs> Sounds like the evil one, doesn't it? Hmm. They also said that Jesus did not come in the flesh. He did not die. God would not take on flesh. You know, God would not condescend to become a person. So that's why this test is, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Jesus, the human being, is the anointed one. Jesus, the Christ. That's the one. Jesus did come in the flesh. God did come condescend to become a human being. And so this is what he says in verse 24. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. In other words, don't, don't lean to the left or lean to the right. Keep going down that center narrow road because that which what you heard from the beginning is truth. Don't let anybody sway you from the truth. Hang on to what you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Hold fast, hold fast, hold fast to what you have heard from the beginning. Verse 25, this is the promise which he made himself made to us, eternal life. This is the promise. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil that led to death. So we could just call it the tree of death. And the tree of life and the tree of death. The promise that he has made to us is eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as he has taught you, you abide in him. What does the word abide mean? It means to remain. To abide, to remain. Uh, it's just where you dwell. It's right next to him. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. In other words, he ends the chapter as it is begun. You know, keeping the commandments. That's righteousness. It's not a way of salvation. It's a way of life. If you know that he is righteous, and we know he's righteous, you know that everyone who also, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Hopefully, you know, y'all heard over and over again, you know, that, that dark, bad life, you know. You, see, you heard it because it's right there. I mean, you could make a chart. You know, God and God's ways, the devil and his ways. Just put the two together. You just have this nice little chart. You know, do not love the world. The darkness is passing away. The light is shining. It's a great chapter to really, really, you know, look at and uh, consider. But the most important thing is our obedience to his commands is vital. First off, it shows us that shows him that we love him. And secondly, it shows the world that we're serious about his relationship, the relationship that we have with him. So I commend this chapter to you so that, you know, for your own personal study and just really just, just work on it and chew on it and um, enjoy it. It's a great, great chapter. So, amen. <laughs>